Thanks everyone for coming uh, to our, it's actually a, a joint seminar between ACOM and EOL. And I am happy to introduce Elizabeth Asher, well known as Lizzie, as you know her. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words about Lizzie. Lizzie is currently working as a serious research scientist at NOAA. Prior to this position, she completed her PhD in oceanography at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver in 2015. Mm -hmm. She has been an ASP postdoc uh, at NCAR and a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Land, Air and Water Resources at UC Davis. Uh, in general, I think she is interested in developing instruments and instrument networks to measure concentration, concentrations of aerosol and trace gases that might improve and data-driven approaches to air quality forecasting and climate modeling. And her talk today will be about airborne BOC observations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lisi, for coming. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ivan, for the introduction. Um, I'm really... Sorry, what? Ooh. Um, so thank you for coming. I'm really excited to discuss the whole air sampling pilotless platform, or WASP. Um, and a quick thank you to many of my co-authors who are great mentors while I was here at NCAR, um, or otherwise great people to work with. So as Ivan mentioned, um, I did a PhD at UBC in oceanography, and I studied one volatile organic compound, or VOC in particular, dimethyl sulfide. I was interested in better understanding the sulfur cycle um, and improving emission estimates of DMS. And I sought to do that um, by essentially developing instruments to measure DMS and other related sulfur compounds um, in the surface ocean. Today's talk, though, is about WASP. And I'm going to discuss the motivation for building and designing this instrument, some design constraints, uh, as well as laboratory calibration um, measurements that we made, and some side-by-side -side comparisons that we did. Um, I'll round the talk out with uh, measurements from the Colorado Front Range and a few conclusions and potential uses for this instrument. So the atmospheric boundary layer uh, is temporarily, tempor temporarily and geographically variable. And uh, as well as between transitions of day and night. Um, during the daytime, it's got a mixed layer that's driven by turbulence, um, but I hope to show that even that has some variability within it. So I really like this quote from Yidal, a relatively recent paper. A typical assumption is that longer-lived species, such as oxygenated volatile organic compounds, or OVOC, are well mixed within the ABL, and that chemical lifetimes are much longer than turbulent mixing times. So although I intend to show in the next couple slides that the latter half of this sentence is certainly true, um, the first part of this assumption, that longer-lived species are uniformly distributed in the ABL, um, I don't think is necessarily true. So as I mentioned a moment ago, Turbulence controls vertical mixing in the atmospheric boundary layer uh, during the daytime. And turbulent eddies vary in scale, um, but they're all rather small, and turbul turbulent mixing time scales are typically less than an hour. And of course, that is much shorter than um, the chemical lifetimes of many volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, with respect, for instance, to the hydroxyl radical, or OH. This table is showing a number of compounds I measured during this study, including alkanes, alkenes, uh, aromatics, terpenes, and oxygenates. Um, and essentially, the chemical lifetime of these species um, is between tens and hundreds of hours. So it's much longer than turbulent mixing timescales. And yet, even in a well-mixed atmospheric boundary layer, we can observe strong vertical gradients in VOCs or volatile organic compounds. So there was a study done in the early 2000s in Mexico City um, that used tethered balloons at various altitudes <laughs> to measure essentially VOCs and other trace gas species uh, in the atmosphere. And this figure in particular is looking at several VOCs, propane, benzene, toluene, um, and 
at different times of day. So we're looking at dawn in the top row, uh, mid-morning, I think, in the middle row, and noon in the last row. Along the x-axis is the concentration or mixing ratio of these species, and on the y-axis is altitude for all of these compounds. And essentially what we see is that even, even at noon when we expect a well-mixed atmospheric boundary layer, we see strong spatial gradients in these compounds and spatial variability in the vertical dimension. Now, another paper that came out of this study showed that not only are there spatial gradients or spatial variability in VOC with altitude um, during midday, but you also see the same, uh, same spatial variability in products like, production products like ozone, which is pretty interesting. And this can occur you know, even as late as, say, 2 p.m., when we see nearly constant potential temperature with altitude and constant um, water vapor mixing ratios. The authors, I guess I should note, the authors attributed this spatial variability in the vertical dimension in ozone to um, a number of things, including plumes for precursors, uh, differences in diffusion, and maybe most importantly, because there's a lot of spatial variability there, differences in the efficiency of ozone production uh, due to differences in solar radiation from clouds, et cetera. So making UAV measurements in the atmospheric boundary layer is certainly not new. I just showed a study that used tether uh, tethered balloons that has done this um, close to 15 years ago. <laughs> and um, Essentially, we have a number of means of doing that. That includes uh, balloons, towers, and manned aircraft as well. But unmanned aerial systems, or UAS, can also measure atmospheric composition, um, and they can substitute for many of these platforms. Uh, and in some cases, they might offer actually some really advantageous um, features. For instance, while manned aircraft is expensive and opportunities to fly below 500 feet are limited, um, typically, UAVs obviously have, um, are relatively unrestricted below 400 feet, um, and towers are relatively few and unfortunately being dismantled, um, such as the Boulder Altitude Observatory, or BAO Tower, which was taken down in 2016. And so that offers limited opportunities to um, constantly interrogate the atmospheric boundary layer. And then finally, balloon studies, which have been really useful are beginning to be hampered by our current uh, helium shortage. So that platform is becoming more and more expensive. And um, although you can use hydrogen in the place of helium, that introduces um, more difficult logistics and makes it potentially more dangerous to make these measurements. So just to summarize this introductory section, essentially VOCs are not uniformly distributed in the ABL, or certainly not always uniformly distributed. We have a number of traditional tools to make these measurements, um, but those may not always suffice. And essentially, UAS or UAV measurements can, uh, can substitute for these platforms. So um, this field, the field of making atmospheric measurements from UAS or unmanned aerial systems is rapidly growing. And in 2017, actually, the Earth Observing Laboratory here at NCAR had a community workshop um, and although today I will be discussing largely a sensor suite or a, a single instrument that flies on a drone, one of the takeaways from this workshop is how integrated the sensor suite or instruments need to be with the rest of the platform and how those um, really need to tie together well. And I'll actually discuss kind of the integration of a sensor suite on a platform in particular. So I've tried to convince you already that UAVs are a good means of making VOC observations in the atmospheric boundary layer. But of course, there are challenges associated with doing this. Um, when I set out to design and build the WASP instrument, I had several vague objectives, uh, which are pretty much listed here. I wanted to make multiple measurements of VOC um, and OVOC. I wanted to also measure ambient temperature, relative humidity, and pressure. Um, and I wanted some ancillary measurements of GPS, system flow, system pressure, and battery life. Now, the challenges I quickly ran into were that it's actually difficult to make ambient or representative measurements um, from a UAS platform. 
or unmanned aerial system. And also, um, I wanted to have sufficient sample for duplicate measurements from each of my canisters. But when you are already working with relatively tight size and weight constraints, that can be a challenge. Um, and finally, I'll discuss one last challenge of trying to minimize sampling times um, for this instrument. So as I mentioned a moment ago, sensor placement is key. There are a number of places that you can put a sensor um, on top of a UAS, beneath a UAS, next to a rotor, beyond, you know, kind of out on a boom. And there are a number of concerns that go along with this depending on the sensor. One I'll talk a lot about is quadcopter rotor wash. Depending on your sensor, having sufficient airflow may be a concern. Thermal heating may be a concern on, especially if you've got a sensor located on top of a UAS, um, or off-gassing, depending on the construction material of your, of your platform. So this is a SolidWorks design courtesy of Steve Gabbard that basically shows our instrument on our platform of choice, which is a DGI Matrice 600 Pro. Um, you can see that um, our inlet and sonic anemometer extend well beyond um, the rotors. And so this is clearly our final design that we've chosen to go with. And I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. And we've done our best basically to consider sensor placement um, and as well as maximize sample volume. So we wrestled a lot with sensor placement, actually. And we considered first putting sensors um, and our inlet, I guess, above the UAV uh, shown here in figure A. But the problem with that is that we would be basically raising the um, center of mass. And so we might have a higher overturning moment and uh, increase the instability of our platform. We're worried about flipping the drone. And watching it crash and burn. So the next thing we considered was putting our sensor payload far below the rotors and trying to escape rotor wash in that way. But that makes the logistics of landing and taking off more difficult. And maybe most importantly, CFD modeling of the airflow underneath the drone showed that that is actually the most turbulent region um, underneath the, the copter, essentially. Um, and then we considered various options, uh, basically, a, a ballasted and not ballasted um, boom, which is basically the design we decided to go with uh, in order to get our inlet and measurements in a sustained hover out of that rotor wash. Now, in addition to using previous studies um, as kind of a guide, we also developed an empirical test to look at our in-flight measurements of temperature, pressure, and relative humidity, and use that as a gauge to decide if we were out of the copter rotor wash. So temperature, relative humidity, and pressure is expected to follow the negative 5 thirds power law due to cascading energy um, from larger to smaller eddies in the atmospheric boundary layer. And we basically, for each sensor position, for instance, on top of the UAV here, um, compared our measurements in flight to the negative 5 thirds power law. And we can see that during ascending profiles, for instance, with the sensor placed on top of the UAS, we can make maybe reasonable measurements of temperature, relative humidity, um, and potentially pressure. But uh, when we do a sustained hover, we're mixing up the air even further. And we see that we get large deviations, um, peaks in the frequency spectra, as well as less variance than expected um, over, frequency, over the frequencies that we're measuring. A similar story kind of emerges when we looked at multiple sensor positions. So again, we looked at ascending profiles, a sustained hover for each of these positions, as well as descending profiles, which I'm not showing just in the interest of time. And essentially, you can see that it was easiest for us to make measurements during ascending profiles. Um, and positions A and C seem to do an adequate job, um, or a pretty good job of that. However, during a sustained hover, it was much more difficult. And we essentially had to go to this third option of making measurements on a boom extended at least a foot beyond the rotors in order to have minimal perturbation um, in the natural variance of these signals. So these measurements also kind of showcase what happens on our ascending and descending profiles. 
in a sensor position. So this temperature, relative humidity, and pressure sensor um, is from one of our flights. And this figure is showing pressure, temperature, and RH on the x-axis, as well as altitude on all the y-axis. And uh, this sensor was located basically just on top of the drone. And during the ascents, you can see pressure decreases with altitude. You can see small vertical gradients in temperature and relative humidity. Um, but on the descents, you see these very non-physical uh, changes, especially where you've got a uh, descent punctuated by sustained hover. And that may be due to thermal heating um, or potentially influenced by rotor wash. But they all happen to be in the same direction, which is pretty interesting. So I also mentioned that another design constraint we were interested in overcoming was having su sufficient sample in each of our canisters to make duplicate measurements. So one key difference between our instrument and other whole air sampling instruments on, on drones is that we have pressurized our canisters using a pump. And we do that because basically if we collect a sample at altitude, um, especially if we are able to do longer, bigger vertical profiles, by the time we measure that sample, um, on the ground, it would be slightly under vacuum. And so it would make analysis slightly more difficult. And in our case, because we think we need 120 milliliters for duplicate samples, it would make getting duplicate samples out of our miniaturized canisters difficult or impossible. Um, and the last design constraint I want to discuss is something that we actually ran into after we finished building the WASP instrument. So, as you've seen from some of our last drawings, our canisters are all cylindrical or flat-bottomed. And we were worried that they weren't filling as um, quickly as we first supposed they would. And so we devised a lab test basically involving uh, two concentrations of carbon dioxide, a two-position valve in line with one of our canisters or our WASP instrument, and a CO2 analyzer. And in the case of having a union place of a canister or something with a volume of essentially zero, we would expect an instantaneous change. What we found, though, is that essentially our predicted fill time uh, was much less than our actual fill time. And our predicted fill time is essentially just equal to uh, canister volume times flow. Um, but we think that filling our canisters was less efficient uh, potentially due to the edges of the canister or some kind of channeling within the canister. And so this plot is showing CO2 on the y-axis, mixing time on the x-axis. Um, and for this canister, our predicted flow follows that equation to the left, and our actual lifetime is essentially 1 over this coefficient, which is a simple exponential model uh, that's trying to fit our data. And this is the case for a 100 milliliter canister. But the same was true of a 50 milliliter canister or a 100 milliliter canister essentially within the WASP instrument. So we think that in part, um, we'd like to redesign the shape of our canisters based on this test. But that is something for hopefully the near future. Um, so our instrument in total, including its boom and inlet, weighs six kilograms. Uh, it has a number of different sensors. It's got an ambient pressure sensor an ambient temperature and relative humidity sensor. It has a small GPS antenna that's actually separate from the drone so that we're not beholden to any one platform and we could switch um, instruments or drones, I guess, for this instrument. We have uh, a system pressure sensor, a flow meter, the pump I mentioned a minute ago, a filter to remove particulates from the airflow, um, a small computer board that's a Raspberry Pi and custom electronics board. Um, and, of course, the canister array may be the most important part. Uh, the inlet and the anemometer, as you can see from this lower figure, are out on the boom. This is another SolidWorks drawing from Steve Schertz, uh, and it just allows you to see all of those components perhaps more clearly, as well as the battery, which is hard to see in the last picture. And again, um, we've done that so that we could uh, use any drone without tailoring our power system to a particular platform. How many canisters? Um, so we designed it so that it could carry as many as 15 canisters, but we've currently been carrying eight. Um, part of that is our, based on our fill time and flight restrictions. So we can only fly for so long, and um, 
it, it currently takes us a long time to sample for each canister. So following every flight, the canister array is removed using four quarter turn screws and loaded onto this extraction system that we built. And the extraction system basically just um, maintains when you're analyzing samples on the trace organic, organic gas analyzer, um, it maintains a constant overflow of sample past that inlet at ambient pressure. And again, this is just a SOLIDWORKS drawing, so you can see all of those components from the extraction system more clearly. So I'll play a very short video. You can hear that the WASP instrument's a little noisy, but you can also see that it's pretty stable as a platform. So we were happy with how it actually flies, um, and we were initially worried about it. Um, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and it at present collects eight whole air canisters per flight. It makes, thanks to the TOGA instrument, uh, which has a really wide analytical range, it makes measurements within the range of less than 10 parts per trillion to as many as maybe 50 parts per billion. Um, we have done our best to make ambient representative measurements of the atmospheric boundary layer. We are also, um, I guess, happy that we think we're able to get duplicate subsamples out of many of these small miniaturized canisters, thanks to pressurizing them. It does take us a minute and 30 uh, seconds to basically flush and then fill our canisters. Um, I guess that's a little bit potentially overkill, but... Um, that's how long we're taking at the moment. And it also measures temperature, relative humidity, pressure, um, horizontal wind velocity, and um, system pressure and flow at about once per second. It has a computer program sample collection system um, that is just based on altitude and, and otherwise geographic location. So to summarize this section, uh, our total payload weight is six kilograms. We have a canister array that easily detaches for analysis. It samples VOCs and measures temperature, pressure, relative humidity, 2D winds, like I just said, system flow and battery power. It minimizes the impact of rotor wash, uh, as well as UAV um, thermal heating or off-gassing. And it maximizes canister sample volume. And we're also seeking to minimize uh, the sampling time. Following uh, its construction, we did some laboratory tests basically in the Earth Observing Laboratory's calibration lab, thanks to Laura Tudor. Um, these plots are essentially showing the NCAR Cal Lab's references for pressure, temperature, and relative humidity at three different temperatures. Um, and then on the y-axis, the WASP temperature, pressure, and relative humidity. And you can see the agreement is, is very good. Um, and in fact, indicated to us that we didn't actually need to calibrate our sensors. The agreement was just this good uh, when we bought the sensors. So that was encouraging. We also did a number of side-by-side -side comparisons, or a couple, I should say, between WASP and other instruments. So on the left, you can see on the Foothills Laboratory rooftop, uh, we compared WASP canister samples to a two liters uh, stainless steel whole air sampling canister. Um, and we also did a comparison, or I guess several comparisons during the summer between the miniaturized anemometer on the WASP instrument to a um, sonic anemometer at 10 meters. Although the two liter canister was analyzed three weeks um, kind of after the comparison, whereas the WASP can canisters have to be analyzed uh, really directly thereafter, we found pretty good agreement between VOC um, although OVOC agreement, particularly for compounds like acetone, is decidedly less good. Um, the takeaway from our comparison between the an sonic anemometer at 10 meters and the Trisonica Mini, which is the anemometer mounted to the WASP boom um, in flight, is that the comparison is relatively good. This is a polar plot showing essentially um, wind direction from zero to 360 degrees, and in distance from the center of the plot is showing wind speed. So you can see paired measurements are on the same color, so those were um, a comparison between the WASP measurements, which are diamonds, and the circles, which are uh, sonic anemometer measurements there. 
and the comparison is relatively good, but there are some small differences. Uh, to summarize this section, essentially WASP sensors seem to be accurate and precise based on lab calibrations. Um, the WASP measures OVOCs more reliably than it does, or sorry, VOCs more reliably than it does OVOCs. Um, and we have relatively good comparisons, comparisons between our side-by-side, -side, uh, between our anemometer on the WASP and the anemometer at 10 meters. So now I'm going to present some results from the Colorado Front Range, uh, most of which were done last winter. So we basically had two sites. We made measurements northwest of the Buller Reservoir and uh, at the request of the city of Broomfield because they were interested in looking at background pollution uh, before doing oil and gas extraction, a site near C-470 in Broomfield County. The other site that I've uh, put on this map is a ground-based site, although measurements were made from an uh, altitude of about five meters, run by the Institute of Alpine, or sorry, of uh, Arctic and Alpine Research at CU Boulder. And that location was just southeast of the Boulder Reservoir. So they were geographically close, and I will do some comparisons between the two. So we have a number here of uh, vertical profiles of relative humidity and potential temperature. And essentially, there are very small, if any, gradients, vertical gradients um, in relative humidity or potential temperature uh, from many of our, our profiles. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to these bottom two cases because I will be showing some VOC measurements from, um, I believe it's December 2nd and uh, the 29th, a second profile on the 29th of November last year. We also make wind measurements. Uh, those are done during sustained hovers, if I've fail, failed to mention that so far. And so those are basically showing the average and standard deviation um, of wind speed here along the x-axis with altitude. Wind direction is shown in color here. And essentially, we, uh, as expected, saw that wind speed increases with altitude. Um, and we think we could measure kind of the mean horizontal flow uh, using WASP, uh, the WASP son sonic anemometer, and sometimes measure wind shear or changes in, in wind direction. So the main goal of the instrument that we built, of course, was to sample for VOCs in the atmospheric boundary layer. So these are some of our vertical profiles. Uh, this is one example from November 29th. And uh, in particular, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. So first off, uh, this is show, uh, showing off kind of our, our range of um, measurements. We're able to make measurements below 10 parts per trillion and do as high as you know, 25 parts per billion thanks to the TOGA instrument, largely. Um, I also want to draw your attention to kind of the general vertical structure. So we see that there's potentially some enrichments in various compounds. This is n-pentane, isopentane along the x-axis with altitude, um, and benzene that I'm highlighting now with altitude. You can see that there's basically enrichment uh, near the surface, potentially related to local sources, uh, maybe C470. and then in some cases, there's also some structure at altitude. And so this is basically um, from one of, those, one of those days with a nearly straight uh, potential temperature and RH vertical profile. This was a consistent story for us. We made vertical measurements, or sorry, we made vertical profiles on several different days. And we often found that there was uh, substantial spatial variability in the vertical direction. We also found that we could basically use these VOC mixing ratios, as many other people have done before us, to look at um, different sources of pollution. So in this case, I'm showing a plot of isopentane versus n-pentane. Um, and this ratio essentially can denote the influence of oil and natural gas um, or of urban emissions. And this is relatively consistent with the Frappe study. This is a plot. Uh, from a presentation that Becky Hornbrook did in 2015, showing that um, kind of at the, the Denver suburbs, like Broomfield, are really at the intersection 
of influences of oil and gas and urban emissions. And that's largely what we're seeing here. Um, I should note that the outliers we have, those green samples, those are our Boulder Reservoir, or some of our Boulder Reservoir samples. Um, and so they're potentially less influenced, it looks like, uh, or less tied to the same influences. We can also look at the ratio of benzene to toluene. Um, and so this is a plot showing toluene on the y-axis, benzene on the x-axis. And again, um, green samples are denote Boulder Reservoir samples, and red samples are from the uh, Broomfield site. My apologies to anybody who's colorblind. I recently found out those are not good colors to put together. Um, they have a relatively strong correlation, and again, their slope or um, even the ratio of both of those uh, is indicative basically of mixed influences of oil and gas and urban emissions. And again, that's relatively consistent. It also looks like we're measuring about the same mixing ratios in terms of benzene as it were measured during the Frappe campaign. Now that's pretty broad brush because um, it's hard to see where these locations would be exactly. The last thing, um, in terms of results that I want to present is that um, we made some measurements at the Boulder Reservoir right to the northwest, and there were uh, instar measurements to the southeast. And so this is a comparison basically showing time on the x-axis and benzene on the y-axis here in this case. And this gray line uh, is the time series of instar measurements at five meters. These black dots are the corresponding in star samples to our measurements when we made uh, vertical profiles using the WASP instrument. And in color here, I've kind of shown the concentrations of benzene um, at various altitudes that the, WASP, that the WASP instrument sampled. So you, so basically you can see that there's a relatively good comparison, particularly between our low altitude samples shown in dark blue and these black dots. Um, but there's also a lot of variability in the vertical direction. And you can again see that because the lighter yellow circles um, often fall quite far off the line. Another way of looking at that is this box plot. Um, and so now I've shown basically our different sampling dates that overlapped with the instar time series. And each box plot shows the, essentially the variance in our measurements, the WASP measurements, each black dot shows the corresponding instar sample at five meters. And you can see that the single sample at five meters falls within the range of our measurements, um, but it doesn't capture the spatial variability. And also, because of the spatial variability, it has a very low chance of capturing the mean mixing ratio of VOC in the 100 meter boundary layer. And so you know, that could be important, I imagine, for uh, various models. And again, we measured several compounds, I guess, that were also measured by the INSTAR program. So that includes N-butane, isopentane, N-pentane, uh, propane, benzene, and toluene. And the story remains essentially the same in all of these cases. We found good correspondence between our low altitude samples, we think, um, and very, very much less good correspondence between our high altitude samples and the INSTAR uh, time series. So although there's a ton of information that needs to be captured um, in terms of a time series, there's a lot of vari temporal variability, there's also variability in the vertical dimension. So I will now summarize this section too, just in case I forgot to mention anything. Um, essentially, I hope I showed that uh, we've made vertical measurements of temperature, relative humidity, and pressure that suggest a relatively well-mixed uh, atmospheric boundary layer. Um, these were all daytime measurements. I was restricted to making daytime measurements, and the few times I tried to get up at dawn, it just didn't work out. So um, <laughs> this, is, this is all I measured. Um, we also made 2D wind velocity measurements, um, and we think that we're able to capture, capture basically uh, kind of mean horizontal uh, winds and potentially wind shear in these cases um, 
and that these measurements could be useful as well. We haven't really used them in particular yet. Um, we also show that there are strong vertical gradients in VOCs with altitude, um, even within a well-mixed boundary layer, I think. And that the WASP instrument uh, can confirm, I guess, really um, previously identified sources of pollution using VOC ratios. Um, then the last thing I wanted to mention, which was just basically in the last couple of slides, is that we have good agreement uh, with the INSTAR measurements from the Boulder Reservoir, but also that you know, a single measurement uh, at five meters just can't represent spatial variability or potentially the mean uh, mixing ratio of VOCs uh, in the boundary layer. And I think that's an important point. Overall, um, I think we need more chemical composition measurements to resolve vertical gradients of many chemical species. Um, I hope you think so too. <laughs> UAS are a, potentially a really good means of making these measurements um, based on existing constraints and kind of changes in both fields, in many fields. Uh, the WASP prototype pays special attention really to trying to make uh, ambient measurements uh, and to steering clear of some of the concerns of sampling from a multi-rotor UAV. Um, and we also confirm that there are strong vertical gradients. We're not the first um, study to show this by any means, um, but that this can exist in a well-mixed boundary layer, and also that uh, we can you know, really fingerprint sources of pollution uh, even using this new tool. So there are a few potential uses of the WASP. We really hope it could be useful in the future. Um, Basically, we think that it could provide really helpful information to future ground-based studies by providing more information on spatial variability and the vertical direction, um, and potentially a better estimate of the mean mixing ratios. We also think it could be used for VOC source attribution, um, like we tried to show here. And that under the right conditions, <laughs> it might be used for mass balance flux estimates uh, near probably large VOC sources. So using the wind measurements that we have from sustained hovers um, and the mixing ratio measurements that we make concurrently, that that could be useful. Potentially, we would need more samples to be able to do that. And finally, we think that basically these measurements can be used to test assumptions uh, surrounding VOC gradients given the temporal evolution of the atmospheric boundary layer. That's particularly true potentially with higher pro vertical profiles um, or the ability to fly uh, in the evening um, or at dawn more easily. We have a few next steps and goals, one of which I mentioned is to redesign the canister shape to minimize sampling time. So basically, instead of having cylindrical canisters with flat bottoms, we're thinking of trying to round out those edges and hopefully reduce the channeling or inefficient mixing that's occurring in those canisters. We're also really hoping um, either to use a facility that allows us to make higher vertical profiles um, or seek out other groups that have certificates of uh, authorization or COAs so that we can kind of resolve vertical gradients um, in more of the boundary layer. And we'd like to participate in field campaigns. So if you're interested in collaborating, get in touch with um, my colleagues at NCAR or myself, we'd be excited. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Detlef Helmig's group and the Boulder County Health, Public Health um, Organization for giving me permission to use their measurements in this talk um, from the Boulder Reservoir. Also to thank Laura Tudor for her help in the NCAR uh, calibration lab and Rudy Montoya who painstakingly put together the custom-made electronics boards uh, prior to his retirement. So with that, I'll just say thank you and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Lizzy. very interesting. I'm sure there are questions. So when you show these vertical gradients that it is non-uniform, even if you call the uh, the mixed layer well mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't that also imply that there may be strong horizontal gradients as well? And uh, how would you uh, 
um, make that um, go along with your statement that you hope to do mass flux measurements because mm -hmm. presumably there you need to measure either over a long time or in a number of different places. Yes, so as I mentioned, we may need more canisters basically to be able to do that, uh, to be able to do mass flux measurements at all. Um, eight is probably not sufficient. <laughs> and essentially, um, that would also involve kind of very specialized conditions where you had, yeah, relatively strong mean flow, horizontal gradients um, across a, a large VOC source. Um, so I'd certainly agree with that. Um, potentially that could be done just by basically loading another canister rayon and repeating these measurements. We didn't have the money to facilitate having more canisters or canister arrays at this time. Um, and our sampling time limits us to that number. Um, in terms of making measurements over a longer duration, um, that would be potentially, that could be useful. Um, it might be difficult for us given our flight limitations. So we can stay in flight for about 25 minutes. And so that could, you know, that's the upper limit of a single measurement basically in terms of time. So are you able to get wind measurements both during uh, hovering and during uh, ascents, descents, and horizontal trajectories? Well, we're currently only making wind measurements during the sustained hovers in the interest of having a, me a wind measurement that was concurrent with our um, VOC measurements. Now, I think it might be difficult to make wind measurements for us if we were uh, ascending at five meters per second, we could potentially try and subtract that out um, or look at uh, the, basically the information in, within the, the drone software that lets us know um, how much it's ballasting against certain uh, wind, you know, wind velocities. Are there more questions? First of all, Lizzie, thank you for your talk today. We appreciate that. And question on your sample cylinders. Mm -hmm. Instead of redesigning, have you considered taking an approach like putting a dip tube in or maybe a bent dip tube that would give you a swirling inside no, the cylinder? We hadn't considered that, but we will now. <laughs> That's a great idea. Are there more questions? Thank you, Lizzie, for the talk. Uh, my question is about the second section. There was mm -hmm. this plot that every time that you had a hover, there was a negative bias. In yeah. The second section, so design section, right? I think so. Yeah. That one? Or the next Before one? Before this. That one. It was like, yeah. No, even before, like, yeah. Oh, the, the profile, profile, this guy. No, it was like, uh, that one. no, not exactly this one. There was this one that you were showing that, yeah, even this one works, yeah. Okay, so every sorry. Time that, yeah, every time that you have hover, it there is a negative bias, and interestingly, it never got back. So it's not that the yeah. only point of hover. So if you improve your vertical resolution, your negative bias would be even more. And um, have you considered, like, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I guess, are you looking here at temperature, negative bias and temperature on the descent? Yes, and also like we see, uh, yeah. Yeah, in I think like in most of them you see like whenever there is a hover. Yeah, yep, there's a, a yeah. big bias for sure. So we're currently, I only use measurements on the ascent for this reason, um, but, but go on. Yeah, so like uh, if you if you plan to increase your hovers, you will have like more of these biases. Have you considered like somehow just having a correction? Because it seems that I think it, they're probably they are correlated with the time of hover that you yeah. have. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, so I guess I think my presentation was maybe a tiny bit confusing because um, I'm currently only using basically temperature, pressure, relative humidity measurements from these ascents. And then on the descent, I basically don't use any of that temperature, pressure, or relative humidity data. And part of that is because of these sustained hovers. I mean, another idea that 
um, I haven't done because I'd have to basically change the electronic, like the length of electronic cords and stuff, is putting all of these sensors out on the boom. This is something that Becky suggested a while ago. Um, and that might basically decrease this negative bias that I could see during hovers. And at that point, maybe all of the data would be usable. At this point, uh, I've been only using the ascent data, partly based on where I placed the sensor, but also thinking that I didn't necessarily need, or I was more interested in knowing what the vertical profile of temperature relative medium pressure looked like, but then I didn't necessarily need um, one second data after that on these measurements. So maybe I missed it, but why, mm -hmm. why are you getting this negative bias? So I think that might be related to the thermal heating from the instruments or, well, that wouldn't make sense because that's negative, yeah. But maybe then rotor wash. I don't really have an explanation for exactly what's causing this, these strong biases. Um, but the one at 50 meters goes the other way. Yeah, this one here. Um, that's true. That's extra strange. So that could potentially be rotor wash and how you're mixing up the air. And that's something I've like thought about, but I haven't done a good job of discerning. Do you have a surface measurement, like a two meter? Yes, measure yeah. How does that compare? Um, well, typically, I start measuring before I take off. And so, you okay, know. Independent, not from Oh, a, not from WASP. Not from um, no, although at least the INSTAR measurements have a surface measurement at two meters, which I could compare. And I've thought about you. They also have wind data to compare to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lizzie, sorry if I missed it. But um, how do you know these are biases and not just the real atmosphere changing? Do you, do you see this pattern every time you fly? or is it? Um, I see this pattern every time I fly. But it just seems completely non-physical. I mean, even if there was basically a strong wind and a lot of advection of a different air mass, just sustained negative changes and positive changes during a hover just don't seem real. Um, I don't have a better explanation for it than, than that. So I'm not sure if this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not sure if this would be important if there's like light winds, but if there's a pretty strong wind and your boom is facing away from the wind, um, are you able, first of all, are you able to know that while you're actually making the measurements? And is it possible? <clears throat> Is it possible to have that feedback feed back in to some sort of partial autopilot, or is yeah, this something no, that that's you a have great to question. deal with later when you actually are able to do autopilot? Uh, that would be something I would do later, I guess, when I've basically got more communications between the autopilot and the instrument. Currently, basically, I was planning for that. So I would look at the weather forecast and <laughs> measure the wind on the ground, basically, and see what the wind direction was supposed to be with altitude. Uh, and then I would place my boom in that general direction, at least in 180 degrees um, kind of leeway. And, and that seemed to give me, I guess, pretty reasonable measurements, I thought. But certainly, I think if the boom was facing directly away from the horizontal wind direction, that would be bad for me, and the measurements would suffer. Currently, that's under like user error, user <laughs> intelligence. Uh, my feeling was too that this could be real. I mean, there's That's no reason why it shouldn't be real. I, you know, I don't see why it shouldn't be real. If you, you know, if, if after 25 minutes your humidity goes up by five percent, it's totally, totally normal, and it's just that's what, what it is. So I'm, I, I wouldn't dismiss that. Okay. That's question one. Question two. I forgot when you designed this thing. Why not start with the canisters evacuated? Mm, yeah. So I probably didn't explain that well, but the reason that we pressurize them was largely driven by the fact that uh, I wanted to get duplicate subsamples out of each one. And we already moved up in size from a 50 milliliter size canister to a 100 milliliter size canister. And that was you know, ever so slightly heavier, bigger, more cumbersome. We couldn't really keep going up in size. Um, and if we evacuated the canisters, then we would end up with potentially well, a little less sample than 100 milliliters. And it would make getting duplicate subsamples out of our canisters hard for us. And so, if you, if well. If you evacuate them, the, the mixing thing goes away. Yes, the mixing thing does go away, yep. And the getting them up to ambient should be pretty fast. And then the pump does the rest. We'd have to, yeah, we just would have to have bought another pump and put it, and, and the one other constraint is just like we were going to use the toga analyzer, right? And it 
needs to sample at ambient pressure, so we would have needed another pump basically to evacuate that canister again from the sample extraction system, which was entirely composed of things we found in the lab. I still don't see why you can't pressurize it and, and start ejecting it. Is there a leak issue, though, if you start with an evacuator? Well, there's a potential leak issue. Basically, if we pressurize them, any leak is less likely to lead to contamination if there is a leak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did consider that, though. I mean, as as an option in terms of <laughs> evacuating canisters, and that's how most WAS systems work, right? But. Um, Are there mm -hmm. more questions? Yeah. Sorry, I missed a big out the talk. I was wondering, so. At CSU, they're their group. They did. They also used drone. They also did computational fluid dynamic simulation. They mm -hmm. found uh, some of the places around the drones are certainly very bad places to say, take samples, while some other places might be better. I was wondering, have you considered that direction at all, like um, computational fluid dynamic simulations? There are a lot of studies that have done CFD modeling, basically, for various hectocopters. And so to me, it seems pretty similar. In fact, people have done it for the DJI Matrice 600 Pro. And so they have you know, various uh, recommendations based on that. And we certainly looked at those. Um, but partly because they've been done so often for so many different types of copters, um, we wanted to just have one more external check rather than either go off these recommendations or essentially repeat these CFD modeling studies. So. Are there more questions? I just have one question. So mm -hmm. do you need a special permit to fly this here in Boulder? And is it different here, Boulder, than, let's say, Denver or Broomfield? Um, so yes and yes. You do need a special permit, uh, which I have, to fly. Um, and that just allows you to fly to basically 400 feet to operate as a commercial pilot um, of a UAS. But then in Boulder, uh, there are a lot of restrictions on where you can fly in terms of property. You can fly you know, over your private property, but all public pop property is off limits, uh, except for one um, aero modeling kind of park that's near the Boulder Reservoir, which is where we made these measurements. Um, but you know, a lot of county, it, it varies by county. So I think in Denver, there also might be restrictions in a lot of big urban areas. There are restrictions because people don't want to be photographed by drones or constantly hear them buzzing around. Um, but in Jefferson County, you can fly them anywhere. You can fly them from the top of Mount Evans, for instance. So, so, so do you have a Part 107 license? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got that when I realized that the instrument was going to work. I was like, OK, now I have to fly it. <laughs> <laughs> so. OK, there are no more questions. Let's thank again Lizzie. Thanks, guys.